Long story but? Long story but... A long story but... Is the long story but? In this episode, we're going to chat with my dear friend, Ellen. I wanted to chat with Ellen about a production she did at the University of Oregon called Mackinac. But first, I think it's important to give a little context on how the play came to be. On March 20th, 1927, Albert Snyder, an art editor for Motorboat Magazine, was tied up by his wife, Ruth, and her lover, Henry Judd Gray. The crime was brutal. Albert was bludgeoned with a weight from a window sash, suffocated with rags soaked in chloroform, and strangled with wire from a picture frame. It seemed as though it was a crime of passion, scattered, messy, and unplanned. Ruth attempted to stage the murder as a robbery. While the Snyder's nine-year-old daughter slept in her room, her mother claimed two giant Italians broke into the family's home. She claimed they knocked her unconscious before tying her up and leaving her in the hall. These two men, according to Ruth, then killed Albert and stole her jewelry. But the police knew that made no sense. The story seemed off, and when her jewelry was found stashed under her mattress, they began to ask questions. Poking around the home, the police noticed a note signed J.G. that Albert had in his things. When they asked Ruth about the note, she immediately began to panic. She insisted that Judd Gray had nothing to do with this. The police had never mentioned Judd Gray. The note was a memento of Albert's from his deceased fiance, Jesse Gouchard. The woman had been important to Albert, so important that he insisted on hanging a photo of her in his home with Ruth, and so began Ruth's jealousy. Albert also named a boat for Jesse and told Ruth that Jesse was, quote, the finest woman he'd ever met. Ruth began an affair with a married corset salesman, Judd Gray, and started to plan Albert's murder. She had attempted to coerce Gray into the plot, but he was hesitant. Ruth had already tried and failed seven times to kill Albert. She also persuaded him to purchase life insurance worth $48,000, with a clause to pay extra should the deceased die of violence. The police were very wary of Ruth's story, and the JG note led them to Gray. He was in Syracuse, where he claimed to be all night. Though a friend of Gray's admitted to setting up a room to create an alibi for him, and found out Gray was forthcoming. He claimed Ruth coerced him to help. He even said that Ruth was able to control him. The entire situation was a little bit off, to police, journalists, and the public. It was called by journalist Damon Runyon the dumbbell murder, because it was frankly just so dumb but it was fuel for tabloids. The Daily Graphic and the Daily News in New York, along with William Randolph Hearst's Daily Mirror, began to attempt to outsell one another, printing tawdry stories with shocking details, and they didn't hesitate to make up information that would add some color to the stories. In the journalistic coverage, writers turned Snyder and her lover into Hollywood stars. Ruth was the femme fatale, a murderess who wanted her husband dead, and his life insurance to start again with her lover. Gray spoke to tabloids, attempting to paint himself a victim. He claimed that Ruth would put her face close to his, staring into his eyes, hypnotizing him, before slapping him to gain control of his mind. The couple were both charged with the murder of Albert. In the trial, the once lovers turned on one another. Each was convicted and sentenced to death, 
Ruth's electrocution was caught on film. Despite cameras being forbidden from the execution room, a photographer snuck a camera in on his ankle and captured the moment when the electricity pulsed through her body. The blurred image shows the movement of Ruth's convulsions as she died at 11.06 on January 12, 1928, only moments before Gray, too, was electrocuted. Quote, From the sordid mess of a brutal murder, the author, actors, and producer of Machinal have with great skill managed to retrieve a frail and somber beauty of character, wrote New York Times theater critic Brooks Atkinson of Treadwell's Machinal in its Broadway debut. Sophie Treadwell, a journalist and writer, was captivated by the story of Ruth Snyder. Rather than covering the story as a journalist, Treadwell became entangled in the dramatic coverage as an artist. She attended the trial and followed the headlines, finding in the story bits of herself and broadly questioning what would drive a woman to commit such an act. Treadwell was born of a troubled marriage, and her parents' difficulties are often reflected in her own work as is her strong and independent grandmother, who tended a large family ranch following the death of her husband. Treadwell excelled in writing and attended Berkeley from 1902 to 1906, during which time she worked as a correspondent for the San Francisco Examiner and began experimenting with writing plays and other fiction. This was also the time in her life when she first began to experience mental health challenges, described in the turn of the century as, quote, a nervous condition which she carried throughout her life. But she was more than an anxious writer. She was also an activist, having joined the Lucy Stone League of Suffragettes. She advocated for sexual freedom and independence for women, birth control, and maintained a separate residence from her husband. During the calamity of the Ruth Snyder case, Treadwell began to piece together a play, Machinal, in which a young woman named Helen works as a stenographer. She feels compelled by social expectation to accept a marriage proposal made by her boss, George H. Jones, the owner of the company, and by all accounts, a financially safe choice for a husband. She submits and accepts his proposal, despite her own distaste for Jones, due to her financially dependent and nagging mother. The play explores a woman challenged by the mechanization of the 20th century, breaking as she attempts to conform to the expectations of the time taking on a husband she's repulsed by, and providing him a child not born of love, but of obligation. Machinal, meaning automatic or mechanical, explores what happens when a woman conforms to a system that she's stifled by, one that is suffocating to her being. Ultimately, the play finds Helen having an affair with a well-traveled and dangerous man. In her affair, she finds the love she never felt with her husband. She sees what life could have been. Inspired by the Ruth Snyder case, Treadwell ends mock and all with Helen killing her husband, her lover turning on her in court, and her execution by electric chair. Much of Treadwell's own life can be seen in the work. The anxieties about life, the resistance to the subservient, conservative, domestic place of a woman, and the assertion of self. Of mock and all, Brooks Atkinson of the New York Times described the Broadway production as, quote, the tragedy of one who lacks strength. She's not adaptable, she submits. Being the exposition of a character, stark and austere in style, Machinal makes no excuses for the tragedy it unfolds. In February of 2019, Ellen directed her own version of Mock It All.
In casting Machinal, Ellen made what some might think is an interesting choice. Casting the play, which is written for seven women and 21 men, to be an entirely femme cast. What is it that compelled you to do theater and how did you get into putting on productions like this? Big question, right? <laughs> But Ellen's research isn't just about challenging gender norms, it's more broad. Thank you. 
in terms of the impact that you wanna have. And I hear a lot about almost empathy, both putting people into a different perspective by casting a femcast or changing accents or asking people about accents kind of changes the perspective of the audience. So in a way, it kind of sounds like you're asking the audience to perform a different viewership of theater, almost wrestle with our own biases that we bring into a performance. Cool. <laughs> so what do you think in terms of like impact broadly that this kind of work could do and in what other ways could we apply this? Uh, empathy is important and not enough people have it. <laughs> so what can we take away from Ellen's research? Right here, right now. <laughs>
Ellen works to challenge our assumptions on stage, but in a way that resonates outside of theater too. How can we work to better recognize our own biases, challenging our assumptions, the ones that feel like a natural fact, but are informed by our own identity and levels of privilege? Ellen's work is a practice of compelling empathy, asking audiences to sit with our own implicit bias, blind spots that we can recognize in a safe space and then carry on through life. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your support on this new project. I love to hear from y'all, so reach out on social media or email me at longstorypod at gmail.com. This podcast should be available on the listening platform of your choice. And if it isn't, let me know. Head over to that platform, rate, review, and subscribe. It really does help. And don't forget to check the show notes for resources and helpful links from Ellen. Again, I'm truly grateful for your support. Until next time. That was cool. You hit-